Just a quick introduction for uh, Tiffany Norwood. I got to know Tiffany over the last few months on Zoom. We must have met four times. Each time lasted longer than the other because we were into so many interesting discussions. Uh, her biography is in the material, but I have to say a few words. Uh, at 27, I believe she received her first patent. She raised uh, $670 million for a startup, a satellite startup, when she was in her 20s. She's a musician, uh, she's an artist, she's a very big supporter of innovation and innovation literacy, which is something that resonates with us at CIPU. Um, she's a force of nature, really, um, and uh, I'll just let her speak for herself. Tiffany? Thank you. Oh, no pressure, right? <laughs> I, have to, I have to say one more thing that I forgot and I've remissed. Entrepreneur of the Year at Cornell University. Uh, she's in good company. Uh, preceding her was Erwin Jacobs, uh, some years back, uh, CEO and founder of Qualcomm, and Sandy Weil of uh, Citigroup. So this is, uh, this is her milieu. <laughs> I'm in my 50s, but I like to say I'm just getting started. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me here today and to be live is extremely, extremely special. Um, as Bruce mentioned, you know, I'm a lot of things, but really if you were to generalize it, I am a creative and a creator. And I want to talk about that imagination and creativity and how that leads to invention and innovation and how that leads to changing the world and why IP is important, especially from my experience as an inventor entrepreneur, um, which actually is a unique experience. I spend a lot of time now working with the USPTO um, because they told me that less than 3% of patents ever really make it to market, and even fewer than that are successful or scale. Um, so to be an inventor entrepreneur where you not only invent things, but you bring it to market so that other people can use it is unique and also very important in the world. So today I wanna start with my imagination and some of my dreams. I wanna end with magic and in between talk about the importance of innovation, some of the disruption that we need in the space um, to be ready for the future. So my innovation journey started in the 70s. I was born in 1968. Uh, we all seem to mainly be of a certain age in the room, so we know what a incredibly disruptive year that was. Um, I actually was a pandemic baby. It was in H1N1. So, you know, for me, the second pandemic is old hat. I was made for it, right? Spoiler alert, everything will turn out okay. <laughs> and I started coding in the 70s too. Even before I had a computer, I used a book and paper and pen. Uh, one of the things that you'll find about creators and entrepreneurs is that we don't let um, resources or lack of resources get in the way. Um, what if has been the question that I've been asking my whole career, and that is the innovator and inventor's question. What if we do this? What if, what if I do this? What if we change this or that? And in, in asking that question, I have taken a journey that has gone from backpacks to esports. The first patent I filed was for the one strap backpack back in the 80s. I was 19 when we filed. The patent was issued when I was 21. Um, this is actually it, the very first one strap backpack. You can see the innovation in the design was that our bag tapered to a triangle with a single strap that clicked on either side. And since then, that design has been used in a variety of different uh, ways. But also, um, that experience was transformative for me because we started a company against it called Topac. Um, which stood for Tiffany Oliver, Phil Anthony, and Q for quality. Um, but really, we just wanted it to rhyme with backpack. 
Um, we did have a lifetime guarantee on the bags. We were very innovative, not only in the design, but in the material that we used. That's Kodora, which was a radical fabric uh, back then. And now as a global public speaker, I literally will bump into customers that bought the bag 30 something years ago. And they're like, yeah, I still have it, still works. And I'm like, thank God, you know, I'd probably have to, if, with the money back guarantee, I'd go broke trying to pay people back if, if I'd known I was going to be a public speaker all those years later. The second uh, time that I got paid and value for my um, intellectual property was in the coding space in the 90s. I created software code mainly to replicate and automate myself. I was working in uh, Wall Street at the time, working in M&A, uh, very long hours. If anyone's you know, spent time on Wall Street, if you've been a consultant at one of the big consulting firms, those same type of hours, no sleep. But I uniquely had a coding background. I had went to Cornell University, computer science, electrical engineering, and then um, midstream switched to economics and statistics. Um, because I wanted to be a tech entrepreneur, and that was the only way I could sort of create the various things that I needed within Cornell to do that. So I had this unique experience of coding back then, so I created this code to automate the analysis that we were doing at the time for some of the large bank mergers. Um, I actually brought the full printout of the code, um, and I'll talk to you more about that story because that is one of the use cases that I'm going to use to advocate for intellectual property and the importance of it. Um, and then sort of uh, finishing up on some of my creations, and there's been a lot over the years. Uh, I'm a serial entrepreneur. Eight startups uh, so far, which means I tried even many more things and failed at it <laughs> to get to the eight. Uh, but the last one I want to sort of touch upon, because at my heart and soul, I'm a social entrepreneur, um, is World Space and the satellite radio startup. And Bruce had mentioned, you know, at 27, I had raised the money uh, to fund that startup. Uh, we launched three satellites into space to cover every country on Earth. Our North American satellite is XM Radio. But the first satellite we launched was over Africa and the Middle East. Um, and it was because of Nelson Mandela. He had become president. He was doing truth and reconciliation. They didn't have the infrastructure to uh, be able to speak to the entire country. So when he had found out about what we were doing, he had reached out personally and said, hey, that first satellite, would you launch it over Africa and the Middle East first so that I can speak to our country? We're in trouble. Um, and we were like, of course, uh, you're Nelson Mandela, of course we will do that. Um, and this is that satellite. Oh, by the way, I'm in that picture, but this was before smartphones. So this picture was literally taken on a disposable camera that I happened to have in my purse. That's me right there. A lot of people are asking me, why don't you have all these pictures from you know, that time? And I'm like, we didn't have smartphones. I also am easily distracted, so I was lucky that I had a disposable camera in my bag at the time. Um, so this is the uh, actual satellite um, that we launched, the first one. Um, but beyond just asking us to launch the first satellite over Africa, he also gave us another challenge. He said, beyond the, the telecommunications issues, we also have power issues. So while you're at it, can you create a, a satellite radio? And those are some of our original concepts of the original satellite radios on that table there. I'll sort of leave some of those things as show and tell on the table if you guys are interested in seeing during lunch. But he also um, said, you know, we, we want everyone in the country to have access to hearing truth and re reconciliation. So while you're at it, can you all somehow uh, create a solar powered kinetic radio that we can distribute with the satellite uh, radio receiver embedded in it so that we can give it to Soweto and Pretoria, et cetera. And we said, sure. And this is the power of invention and innovators. This is one of the original radios. We, there was a South 
I want to say he was either South African or British uh, inventor that we found that had gotten somewhat close to it. We poured money and collaborated, um, poured more money into what he was doing, collaborate with him. And so when we launched the satellite, we also had made and distributed these radios. You can see the solar powered panel here. Um, this is from the 90s, so I sort of broke the handle, but you know, it, it, it was kinetic, it wound up so that they could store power, and also we have the antenna, um, and they could receive the satellite radio signal on these uh, radios. So it was incredibly transformative. Um, and you know, all along the way of those inventions and stories, there was uh, intellectual property that played into it. Uh, for me, when you look at the backpack example and the code example, in both cases, I had to defend those creations. Um, with the backpack example, I was the president and CEO of Topac. We had four founders. As I mentioned, our name is an acronym. And at one point, we were in 50 retail outlets. We were in Spike Lee's joint, which was super cool for me because I was a geek and he was cool. So some of that coolness sort of rubbed off on us. You know, we had made it to the New York Times. And of course, with all that tension, uh, there were com large companies that then wanted to get in on the game. And we were approached by one of the large uh, bag manufacturers about being acquired. Uh, which I loved the idea, having the reality of also running the company. Um, I knew that we needed help and that we weren't going to make it unless if we either had a partner or some sort of um, in investor or expertise that came in to allow us to scale beyond the 50 uh, retail outlets we had, beyond the manufacturing we had in Schenectady, beyond the call center that I think at the time we had in Georgia. Um, there weren't a lot of third party uh, software as a service, you know, like offloaded onto some other company situation. So when you're running a company as I was, you literally had all these various parts that you had to hire and manage against yourself. So when they came and offered to acquire the company, I was all for it. Um, the challenge was that we, in our operating agreement, needed unanimous consent for the company to be acquired. And three of the founders wanted the acquisition and one didn't. So the deal went through, but that company started making the backpacks anyway. So that was my first lesson learned, that the intellectual property and the patents and all of that is only as valuable as you can defend it, especially on the patent side. So then let's, let's fast forward to the software code, right? So I'm on Wall Street, as I mentioned, I create this code actually on my own time. If you look back, and this is very unusual now, you have to go back one more. So I don't know if you can see it from back there, but it says author Tiffany Ann Norwood, October 31st, 1990. That was the first version of the code. Um, you may say, why do I have that authorship and it's so neat and organized and it goes on for about 30 pages? Well, one, I'm a female coder. I think we code more cleanly than guys, so we can debate that later. <laughs> Two, I had already learned my lesson with the backpack, so I started tagging everything, right? And, and I always, because I thought of coding as a story and a narrative that you tell the computer over and over again, which it is, um, I would always put authorship and sort of where I was with the version and inline documentation all throughout my code. So when we uh, got to the point where the managing director of this particular firm was like, wow, Tiffany, how are you like rolling out this, these reports and everything so quickly and doing this analysis so quickly? And, and this is awesome. I said, you know, I created this program sort of on my own time because I was getting home at 4 a.m. and not having weekends off. And so I decided to automate 
myself. And, and mind you, this wasn't part of my job description. This uh, wasn't anything that I was asked to do or told to do. And I wasn't paid additionally for it. So as I'm talking about this, there was a guy, uh, Steve, I was an analyst, he was an associate, that said, no, actually, she didn't do it. I did it. And I'm looking at him because he literally doesn't even know how to code. But that, remember, this was back in 1990, 91, 92. That was the dynamic of the world then. You know, like one, you needed about 50 women's truths to equate to one man's truth, maybe. And maybe you could do that. Um, so, I mean, I was fuming, as you can imagine. And I said to Steve in the meeting, I was like, okay, well, what's the first 20 lines of the code? And he was like, how would anyone know the first 20 lines of the code? I was like, oh, because I did it, and it's the authorship. It's the name, it's the version, it's the date, it's the authorship. And it says author Tiffany Ann Norwood, all three of my names, just so that we're clear. <laughs> and the, the partner told me to calm down. So I go home that evening, um, and I wasn't calm or down, right? <laughs> and I was like, how do I handle this? Now, even though I was only, by then it was 92, so I was 24 at the time, I had already had the experience with intellectual property, which was unusual back then for just a regular person, and especially a young person. Unlike all the rest of them, I was an inventor. I had a patent. So although I didn't have the, I had more student loans than any sort of reserves to hire an IP attorney, I did have enough of uh, a background to sort of craft my plan. And the plan was, they made it clear often that we were at will employees. I knew that that went both ways. So I went in the next day and I resigned. And I gave them two weeks notice and I said, please, let me know what priorities you want me to work on. John, who is the managing director, um, and which projects you want to have me hand off. Everything but the code, that's mine. That's my intellectual property. It's covered under federal copyright laws. Um, so he sort of looked at me, and I said, but then again, you don't really need me because you can ask Steve for it. So everyone went into a panic, and by the next day, I had licensed, licensed my software code for the first time. So is intellectual property important? From my perspective, absolutely, absolutely. But that doesn't mean that we can't improve upon the structure and the industry. If you look at those two stories, I sort of played the continuum of IP from copyright to patents. And then I would say trademarking is in the middle. There is a, sort of this beginning, middle, and end of the process, right? There's the creation and the, the claim of, of something new. There is then the protection of it, the issuance of the patent or whatever, and then there's the defense. With copyright, it's so much easier because you have assumed ownership. Um, I've since also had more, even more important code. Uh, someone tried to violate the copyright, and again, I was old hand because of this, and so I just went and registered it. You know, I live in DC, so I got just went in person even to register it. This was about 10 years ago. Got the registration slip, and then you know, pretty much the, uh, within a few months, the dispute was over. If you try to do that with patents, not so much, right? And, and a lot of, if you're a smaller inventor, um, a lot of larger institutions play on that, unfortunately. I think for society, it's really important for us to innovate that space. Um, use copyright as a muse. Use some of these new technologies that Bruce was talking about uh, to distribute truth. Because right now, we have centralized truth in the process. Uh, so you think of DeFi, decentralized finance. Why not DeTrue, right? Decentralized truth. Um, and, and I think it's where it's most important is probably in the beginning of the process or in the non-disputed part of the process, like 
with uh, copyright. So you all have a lot more experience at this than I do, but if I were to give an example of it, why can't we use blockchain uh, to basically lay claim to the invention and to start the claim date uh, versus having to necessarily file all this paperwork at the patent office and then have it extend for a period of time that you have assumed coverage with uh, pointing to that time that you got onto the block and with whatever you attached to the chain, uh, that if, if there is a dispute, then you can sort of go into a more formal process to make it more accessible. Because at the end of the day, every solution to every problem or challenge that we have in the world is in someone's imagination. Right? And if we only have a limited amount of imagination coming into the world, we limit ourselves you know, as a society. It's important for us to make that more accessible. And it's important to uh, value it still through intellectual property. That is an inspiration for me, right? The fact that I have maybe 20 years to make something out of this thing that I created and, and be able to reap the value of it or my uh, my family or my descendants be able to reap the value of it. That is important. Um, so the second part of it is awareness, because I had some happy endings, maybe not the happiest of endings. You know, I maybe could have made more off that first software uh, license that I did. But, but it, I would have felt really bad if I had gotten nothing, right? Not the, both the claim is important, like that was my genius, right? As well as the value. So I had this level of awareness from the backpack that most people don't have. So I think we also need to, beyond uh, innovating the system, is also increase IP awareness. And you might ask how early, you know, I say start early, how early? This early, right? So I've been going around teaching innovation literacy. I equate it to imagination and creativity because that's what it is. You know, at the end of the day, artistic creativity is the music and the, the films and everything that we'll hear about later. Uh, practical creativity are the inventions and the innovations, but it's all creativity. And if we speak to it in that way, it's very easy for even middle schoolers and young kids to understand, because if who's not more creative than a middle schooler or, or a young kid? Um, so this is something I've spoke to a bunch of middle schoolers in, in Atlanta last week. Okay, so one, two, three. So, like at the end, uh, me and this company RPX went down. I went down as the innovator and inventor. I showed them all these cool things, including some stuff that we're doing in the metaverse and esports. I told them about my journey and about how it's just imagination and creativity and how you can make this whole career off of being creative beyond music beyond film, right? And then uh, RPX then conducted this ice cream challenge where we brought ice cream in, all these different ice cream scoops, and then they were to innovate the ice cream scoop. So we went from them being like, what's this patent and innovation stuff to that was the very last moment. Yay, patents, right? And I think one of them is even gonna try to file for this uh, ice cream scoop that they created of which uh, that was not me, of <laughs> which uh, RPX is going to support them in. So I want to finish off, because I am a creator and an innovator, with some of my intellectual property in the form of a poem dedicated to Hermione Granger. To me, she is the icon and the role model of innovators and inventors, right? Uh, unlike the unicorn, which is a rare sighting, Hermione is self-made. You know, most, most of us can relate to being called muggles or thinking that you have no magic within you. And then, again, through self-determination and practice and experimenting and prototypes and everything else, you come to show yourself to be full of magic. 
So I'm going to uh, share a bit of, of my magic and uh, also show you Hermione as an adult. Did anyone see the um, live play Harry Potter and the Cursed Child? So in London, when, this is a play where they grew up to be, it was about them as adults, right? And in London, when they were cast, when J.K. Rowling was casting all the characters, she had casted Hermione as a black woman, which I love, not just because of black girl magic, which everyone talks about, right? <laughs> I, the reason why I loved it is because it reinforces that Hermione was always meant to be everyone. And I'm sure someday there will even be a Herman Granger. So with that said, I close with Hermione rising. I imagine a better way, something disruptive and innovative, used and revered, demanded and paid for, something transformative. Imagination, why do we deny it and discount it? It's the source of all innovation. Einstein was theoretical, not applied. Da Vinci, an artist and a scientist. George Washington Carver, no vision, no hope. And Harriet, well, Harriet had to have imagined freedom before she took the first step. I have a dream of traveling in space, of curing cancer, of running for office, of peace, unity, equality, and equity. You get what I'm saying? It's not about the how, it's about the why, the sense of purpose. No need to teach imagination, just endorse it. And with grace, give space for it. It's not to be packed away. It should be on display in schools and offices and I pass summits, right? A priority among the others. Serious vote for tinkering and sketching and making and for play. Forcing memorization of someone else's prior imagination is not the way. The recipe gives space to extend and expand a concept through empathy and understanding, through diversity and collaboration, an embrace for imagination in the case of them all. The more minds that imagine together, the more innovation blossoms. The more diverse these minds, the taller it grows. And if it's fueled, by love and understanding, it thrives and soars. We are seven billion strong brothers and sisters. We can do anything unless we fight each other. Go human or go home. My fellow daydreamers, you are our future game changers. Your place is at the top of the class. Take out your wand and cast the spell of I want that. It's okay if it's messy. Invention and innovation is always messy. Practice, rehearse, experiment, and try. Screw up and then rise up. Wield the magic of hope and faith. And know that the world may attack your genius now, but love you for it later. Hermione is rising and her power is limitless. And so is yours. I pray you too will use it for the greater good. Thank you.